Hey guys, this is an example video on curve sketching. Specifically, I'm going to show you how to um, graph a curve with a cusp. A cusp is like one of these little points right here. The way the, these videos work, you want to pause and try parts of the example when you're prompted, and there are always free guided notes available at DivideAndConquerMath.com. And hey, if you could do me a solid, maybe consider liking my video, subscribing to my channel, or leaving me a comment. Okay, so let's get started. We want to sketch the curve f of x equals x to the 2 thirds times 5 minus 2x. So we've got a rational exponent times this other part of the expression. So first things first, if you watched any of my other videos on sketching curves, you always want to start with just kind of getting these three parts out of the way. It'll just kind of set the expectations for the rest of the problem. If you want to see a breakdown of why we sketch the curve the way that we do, I'll drop a video to a much longer example and lesson on this in the comments or in the description. Pause the video and fill this out. Hit play when you're ready. Okay, so in this case, so for my domain, as you're thinking about this, so this rational exponent, this is really, you're like taking a cube root. And with taking cube roots, um, the, the just in general, the domain of those would be all real numbers. So this is the domain of this is going to be all real numbers as is this. So the domain of the whole thing is just going to be all real numbers or you can write it in interval notation. I just prefer my fancy R. Then for symmetry, so what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to plug in negative x and just work this out and see what you get. So let's see, I'm going to plug negative x in everywhere. And so that's going to leave me with x to the 2 thirds times 5 plus 2x. So this is neither um, negative x or the function itself. So that would lead us to conclude that there is no symmetry. And then for asymptotes, so there's, there are also none in this case as well. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is take our first and second derivative. But I want to give you a pro tip with problems that look like this. I highly recommend that you just distribute this in. It's going to make taking the derivative a lot nicer. Otherwise, you're going to have to use the product rule. And I mean, you can do that, but I just think it's going to create more work. So I highly recommend that you multiply this out and then take the first and second derivative. Hit play when you're ready. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and distribute this. So I get 5x to the 2 thirds minus 2x to the 5 thirds. Now remember, when you distribute this in, you're adding the exponents, right? So this will be 2 thirds plus 1, or really 2 thirds plus 3 over 3, which is why this is 5 thirds. And now I can take the derivative. So I'll just write out all the pieces. OK, so there's the first part of this. So now I'll just multiply everything together to make it look nice. Now, there's probably more that we'll want to do with this later later on, but for now, I just want to leave it like this. And we can take the second derivative of this, no problem. So now let's set that up. And once again, from here, I'll just go ahead and multiply everything together. Now, if you watch different videos on just approaching this, and, and I've actually looked at just different YouTube videos, I think there's a lot of different approaches for this. So if this, the approach that I'm going to kind of follow with this, if it doesn't resonate with you, there are lots of other YouTube videos of just how you can think about rational expressions. Personally, I like to factor them. Just to me, it makes it look nicer. And I'll, I'll walk you through all of that um, as we go along. So just a heads up on that. OK, so next we want to find critical points. So this is our first derivative. So now I want to show you a trick with this, actually. So just looking at this. This is kind of a mess. <laughs> so the way that I like to approach these is I actually like to factor this because a lot of times with these problems, not always, but a lot of times when you factor um, out the unpleasant part of the problem, a lot of times it'll kind of shake out to something nicer. So in this case, you'll notice that, so obviously they both have a common term or a common factor of 10 thirds. And then I also want to factor out just the negative exponent because it will just make my life a little bit easier, I think. So if I factor this out, so this can be a little bit of a brain teaser. 
So what I want you to do is just try to actually factor this out. So the thing I want you to remember, I'm going to reference, just I'm going to go back here for a second. So the thing I want you to remember is that when you check it, whatever you factor out, you should be able to factor it back in and then like make sure that you get back to the original expression. And remember, when you are kind of doing this, you're adding and subtracting exponents. This always throws people off when, when they try to do this. So I'd really recommend that you just pause for a second, and this might take you a moment to really think through it. I'll give you one other tip. If this is totally just throwing you off for some reason, sometimes what I think is really handy is to force yourself to do a much simpler example. So think about how you might do this if this were 10x to the second plus 10x to the fifth. So this I'm sure you can probably do. So just appreciate what you actually do to get to this and then see if you can do it in this tougher example. It's the same reasoning. So again, hit play when you're ready. Okay, so if I divide this first term by this, this is obviously just going to be itself, so this is 1. And then when I factor this out from the other part, so this will be minus x. And so just notice what happens when I factor this back in. So I get, obviously, the when I factor this back in, I get to this first term. And then I'm going to have, this is really going to be 3 over 3 minus 1 over 3, so that gets me to that 2 thirds. So in my opinion, this is just a much nicer thing to look at because then I can figure out my critical points pretty quickly. So, and it's also going to help me figure out my intervals of increasing and decreasing just by looking at it. So now I can figure out just my points here. So we can tell now just by looking at this. So this is a negative exponent. So if you want to take it one step farther and you want to write it like this, that's totally fine. And so now I've got these pieces. So now I can see this is definitely going to um, this is definitely going to be undefined or does not exist at x equals um, not three zero, and it's going to equal zero at x equals one. Okay, so the other thing I want to point out here is that notice that this is where it's undefined, but if I actually plug zero into the original function, it does exist here. This is important to understand because this is going to help explain why we have a cusp here later on. So just notice it's undefined on the first derivative, but it totally exists with f of x. Okay, so now we have to find our intervals of increasing and decreasing. So just as a reminder, so my critical points were x equals 0 and x equals 1. So if you want to pause the video here and set up your own table and find your intervals of increasing and decreasing, then hit play when you want to check your answer. Okay, so I'll go ahead and set up the table. And so now, it, as you're plugging this in, so just remember, we talked about that you can really plug this into this form of the expression. So I'll write this out one more time. And so now if I'm plugging stuff into this, so for instance, if I plug in something less than zero, so this will be something negative times something positive, right? So this will end up being negative. Then if I plug in something between 0 and 1, this will end up being something positive, and this will end up being something positive, so this will end up being positive. And then if I choose something bigger than 1, so this will be positive, but this will end up being negative. So there's my signs for this. And so let me get rid of this first derivative. And now we can choose what appears to be our, our max and mins here. So here I'm going to have what appears to be a minimum. And then here I should have a maximum. So I'll summarize that. Okay, so now let's pivot to finding our potential inflection points. So I want you to do that same thing again where you factor out kind of the undesirable factor. So in this case, I want to factor out negative 10 over 9, and I want to factor out just the largest negative exponent. And I'm like, part of doing this is a little bit of just some, something exploratory to see if it will actually work out. So I want to factor out just the largest negative exponent because then that will hopefully clear out all of my negative exponents. So if you factor this out, see what you get, hit play when you're ready. So if I factor this out, I get 1 plus just 2x, actually. 
And so again, that just makes everything nicer to look at. So again, I'll just rewrite this as, so this is negative 10 over nine x to the four thirds, all of that times one plus two x. And so once again, so my my potential inflection point, so it's either we're gonna, where this um, is undefined or does not exist or um, where uh, this whole thing equals zero. So I'm undefined or does not exist at x equals zero. And then this whole thing will equal zero when x equals, let's see, negative one half it looks like. Okay, so again, I just wanna point out here, notice that this is undefined also on the second derivative, but it totally exists for f of x. So this is really going to kind of point us towards a cusp here. Okay, so next we've got to do our concavity. So once again, why don't you pause the video here, set up the table, hit play when you're ready to see it. Okay, so I'll set up my table. And then once again, so just having kind of this, this form of the second derivative, I think that this just makes kind of thinking through the signs a little bit nicer. But again, that's personal preference. So if I think about plugging in something less than negative one half, so now you have to kind of think through all the exponents here. So if I plug in something, say like negative one, so because this is x to the four thirds, so that four is gonna turn that negative one into something positive, but this whole thing is negative. So this part here is negative. And then if this is negative one, so this will, this will turn this whole thing into something negative. So I have a negative times a negative, so this will be something positive. Then for something between uh, negative one half and zero, so you might have to think about something like, um, I don't know, maybe like negative one fourth or something. So again, this part's always gonna end up staying negative. And then if I do something like negative one fourth, So if you, yeah, so if you plug something like negative one fourth into this, so this will end up being something positive, this ends up being something negative, so this ends up being totally negative. And then something bigger than, than zero, so something like one, this will obviously be positive now. This will stay negative, so this will also be negative. So the thing to kind of notice here again is that, so negative one half is totally fine and we have that change in concavity. So this will be an inflection point, but there's a little bit of an issue here with zero. Can zero, so, so zero is not an inflection point, right? We can see that. And also the first derivative um, also had zero did not exist, but zero again exists on the actual function. So we have a lot of signs now that, that something is kind of up with the zero. It's definitely not an inflection point. Um, we know that it acts like a minimum, but it doesn't exist. And so let's now just start putting this all together. So in looking at these two derivatives now in this form, so like I said, zero does not exist for f prime or f double prime, but it does exist for f of x. This is kind of the big thing that's telling you, you, you probably have a cusp. And also think about places where derivatives actually don't exist. So if you think back to like the list of, of just places where derivatives don't exist, points were one of the places, right? So for this to work, so that this actually works on a graph, but to not have the first derivative exist, that's kind of telling you then that you're gonna have to have something kind of funky. And so a cusp, if you just think about it visually, a cusp cannot have the first derivative exist. That is actually one of the defining characteristics. And so we kind of have everything kind of matching for that, right? This, this is all kind of leading us to that conclusion. Okay, so now I've summarized all of my information here. And first I just wanna kind of plot some of these key points. So I, I don't wanna to worry too much about this cusp quite yet. So first let's just graph the, this point that I think is gonna act like a cusp this max and then this inflection point. Okay, so here's zero, zero, here's my max one, three, and then here's that inflection point, so this negative uh, 0.5 and a 3.78. 
So now let's just kind of round up all the information that we have. So going all the way up to zero, I need to be decreasing. But what I also need to make sure is represented in my graph is that I am kind of concave up, up until negative one half, and then I have to turn concave down um, from negative one half to zero. So let's just start by representing that on the graph. So here I am kind of decreasing but concave up, and I'm gonna make like this very small turn to go concave down. So I like, it, even if you look at the graph itself, it's almost hard to see this because of just the nature of how this is coming down. So it's going to be just like a very subtle change in concavity, but hopefully you can kind of see how this is kind of concave up and then kind of concave down. And so I get to zero, zero is gonna act as a minimum. And then from zero, so now let's just review what do we have to do next. So from zero to one, I need to be increasing. And then from one to infinity, I need to be decreasing. And then also within that, I have to make sure that I stay concave down the entire time. So now that combined with, I know that x does not, um, x equals zero does not exist in the first derivative. I can now get to my cusp. So here's gonna be my little point. And then I get to one and then I turn back down. And so check out how now this actually represents everything, right? So here, now I can see, this is what's telling me the first derivative can't exist because I've got this, this cusp, this point here. I've got my concavity going, and then from here to here, I've got, I'm all concave down. So everything in this now is, is all good to go. So I know this is, this is kind of a lot to kind of put together. So hopefully just kind of breaking down all these little parts to help you figure out the cusp will, will help. Okay guys, so that'll cover this example. So thanks for watching and hopefully I'll see you in another video. Thanks.